Two and a half thousand years ago, a man was born whose ideas would shape the lives of billions and the thinking of a nation. The country is China. And his name is Kongzi, known in the West as Confucius. Born into an age of violence and war, Confucius was the creator of a political and moral philosophy that was designed to bring harmony to the chaos of his times. His extraordinary story saw his ideas rejected in his own lifetime. But, adopted by China's emperors after his death, they have survived China's rich and tumultuous history to influence countless lives. Not just in Asia, but across the world. His teachings have been the foundation of Chinese education for nearly 2,000 years. His ideas of meritocracy, obedience, and moral leadership have profoundly shaped China's political and economic landscape. And his belief in the power of ritual and etiquette to unite a nation still governs everything, from ceremonies of state to the most important unit of Chinese life, the family. To understand China, one must understand Confucius and his legacy. of Confucius' life was first written down in the Han Dynasty, 400 years after his death. After centuries of civil war, this was an era of peace and prosperity, of great innovation and scholarship, in which many of the customs and traditions that define China to this day were born. the heart of court, the grand historian Sima Qian devoted his life to writing the first full history of China, the Shi Ji. Contained within it is a narrative of the events, rulers and families who had made the most important contribution to the Chinese Empire including the first full biography of Confucius. A mixture of fact, oral history and Sima Qian's imagination this biography is still one of the main sources for the story of Confucius's life. And it documents the struggles he endured to get his ideas heard. The biography of Confucius by Sima Qian is actually so important because it's the first attempt the very first one to draw together many stories that um, emerged in the 300 years since Confucius' death. I think Sima Qian was so alert about the very human side of Confucius, how such a man was able to not only survive, but to pass on something very important about being human, about being a moral person, 
And of course, Confucius had no idea that whatever he said would eventually end up being so important to the Chinese. Confucius's father, a retired military officer, had already fathered nine daughters with his first wife and a club-footed son with his concubine. But desperate for a healthy male heir, he courts the 17-year-old daughter of a local family. So his father, in the 60s, was a child who was a child. His father was a child who was a child who was a child. You don't want to marry him, and you don't want to marry him. You don't want to marry him. But the child said, who would marry him, who would marry him. So his third daughter, who was a child, was a child who was a child. His father was a child who was a child who was a child who was a child. 司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁说，司马迁
character Shi. Um, I prefer this idea of the common gentleman. Um, a common gentleman is just one, one level above um, the commoner. And what makes him sort of uh, distinct from a commoner is that a common gentleman is allowed to have an education. As a result, Confucius decides to open a school from which his reputation as a philosopher would be born. And which eventually, we are told, attracts over 3,000 students. It's not schooling in our sense. It's not academic training. As with the early ancient Greek philosophers, it's schooling in a way of life by powerful people. So people with access to power, people with some leisure, people who wish to rule wisely and well. Over time, Confucius's teachings would form the basis of one of China's most sacred texts, the Analects. A collection of his most important thoughts and sayings, they have followed the development of Chinese civilization. Originally compiled by his disciples on fragile bamboo slips, the oldest fragments of the text have been discovered in tombs dating from 300 BC. And they reveal the circulation of different versions of the book in the centuries after his death. In the second century AD, one definitive version was then fixed by being carved onto stone Erected in the Imperial Academy for Scholars to Study and Learn, this version became one of the foundational texts of the Chinese Empire. And this same text has been taught in schoolrooms across China for over 2,000 years. <laughs> Yozi 当中记述的都是孔子和他弟子言行的汇集。The Analect is now the main source of Confucius's philosophy, and contained within it is the moral code that has become the touchstone of Chinese traditional culture. 学而时习之,不亦乐乎,乐乐同,学之为言笑也,人性皆善,而绝有先后。那《论语》呢,作为中国人的圣经,可以说是每一位中国人都应该读诵的一部经典。那这里边所讲的呢,可以说都是关于古
each locked in a desperate and bloody battle for the domination of the country. Confucius is born in an era when all he sees around him is continual warfare. One state fighting against another state, they're assassinating rulers and extinguishing kingdoms as fast as they can. All in all, there are about 14 states fighting for their existence. A central core of around eight smaller states surrounded by a group of larger and more powerful neighbors. Confucius's state is one of the small states. It's the state of Lu, and it borders the great state of Qi. And there's no question that the rulers of Qi were intent on swallowing up Lu. Desperate to find a solution to the violence of his age, Confucius looked back to the past. In particular, to the era of the early Zhou kings, who had ruled large parts of China 600 years before. Many people, including Confucius, looked back to the Zhou as a golden age, as a time when rulers governed their people with virtue and kindness and compassion. Unlike the political disorder of his own times, Confucius believed this was a period of peace and stability, thanks in large part to the ancient rites, customs, and etiquette that bound Zhou society together, a concept he called Li. Li, reduced to basics, is ceremony, ritual. It also refers to what we think of more generally as customs, social practices. What I say when I greet an old friend, what I say when I express reverence for a teacher or a parent. Confucius pointed out how very important those customs and practices are as the glue of society, of keeping us together. In order to learn about the ancient rites and customs firsthand, in 518 BC, when he was around 33, Confucius left the state of Lu. Given a carriage and two horses, he traveled a great distance to the ancient capital of the Zhou kings in modern day Luoyang. Confucius' the rituals that Confucius went to study were above all the sacred rites, in particular the ancestral rites that were essential in keeping the human world in harmony with the cosmos. When we talk about many of the rites, what we're talking about is blood sacrifices, offerings of blood and wine, and offered to the ancestors and the gods in heaven. The ancestors live in heaven and become themselves gods in the afterlife. 
But one doesn't just set out meat and wine. In each case, when offering them, one has to bring to it a particular attitude of reverence. The reimagining of the ancestors, in a sense, brings them back to life uh, with each and every offering. There's really a kind of religiosity in it. You're still grounded in the human world, but there's an elevation. One has to very clearly distinguish that kind of religious experience from, I would say, religious experience that involves a creator with a force that's outside of the human world. The vessels used in these ancient sacrifices of the Zhou kings are now held in the National Museum in Beijing. From enormous sacrificial bowls and stunning sets of bronze bells, to intricately cast drinking vessels, these artifacts are testament to the sophistication of Bronze Age Chinese culture. But for Confucius, they also held a clear message for the same skills that were used to create weapons of war in his own age could once again be used to create objects of harmony and peace. What happened in this period was the beginning of the aestheticization of the human culture, lifting the human being out of our animality and making us into something that is elegant and enchanted. Confucius, at the beginning of a very troubled period, tried to reestablish this the Li that, that had faltered as China became increasingly involved in war. If the ancestral rites aim for cosmic harmony, Confucius believed social harmony could be achieved by the reinforcement of the hundreds of smaller rituals that still govern Chinese life. From handshakes and greetings, to the relationship between young and old, teacher and student, or husband and wife. The aim of Li is to generate a sense of community and caring within the participants uh, of that ritual. So you have rituals like group eating. You know, if you're sitting with among the family, the elder person usually eats first. But when you have drinking rituals, including the family and the teacher, a student is supposed to drink like this without facing the teacher. They are hierarchical rituals. So again, the ultimate purpose is to develop a sense of caring among the participants that would not otherwise be the case. Confucius' genius lies in that realization that what he was doing was transmitting something that was already in everyday practice within the family, within the community. And so these rites, these ritual practices, which were not arbitrary, but have been tested through time by others, today, the ancient town where Confucius grew up is called Chufu. Now one of China's most historic cities, it is home to what we call the Sankong, the three Confucian sites. The first is the Kong Miao, the Temple of Confucius, which is the largest cultural complex in China after the Forbidden City in Beijing. Next door is the Kong Fu, the Confucian mansion, where his later descendants were honored and lived in splendor. And on the edge of town is the enormous Kong Ling, the Confucian forest, where Confucius himself is buried, surrounded by generations of his family. In Sima Qian's biography, Chufu was also the setting for Confucius's greatest political success. At the age of 50,
Confucius had entered local government and had been promoted to the role of Sikao, the minister of crime, where implementing his ideas of Li, he transformed the fortunes of his state. Kunzo 高主啊,儿之来者 as part of this revival at Beidongye village, just an hour's drive from Chufu, the morality of the analects has been woven into daily village life. Yang Bu Jiao, Fu Mu Guo. His for the past two years, the village elder has introduced Confucian lectures to the village, which begin with a daily broadcast of the Di Zigui, a simplified version of the Analects. Chuanchi 为什么感觉不对？这大佬的本性就是社会上是最不光彩的事了。这个通过学习，我发现，像俺说这个例子还很多很多的。这是其中的一个。我这个群领导也好干了。In Confucius's own lifetime, the reintegration of the ancient rites transformed the prosperity of his state. But the politics of his age soon conspired against him. The traces of the sage paintings tell the story that, threatened at the rise of Confucius's state under his guidance, 
the state of Qi hatched a plan that would have profound consequences on his life. According to legend, the state of Qi sent 120 of their finest horses and 80 of their most beautiful dancers to Lu Dinggong, the Duke of Lu. And the Duke was so entranced, he neglected the court rituals and sacred rites, and the Li of the state collapsed in just three days. This picture is very uh, significant, very key, the turning part of his life. He tried a few times to, uh, to persuade the Lu Dinggong, please come back to taking care of the state affairs. Because he failed in persuading Lu Dinggong, there's no hope for him, to, for him to stay on. So he got to find some other way, go somewhere uh, to realize his, his will. Despondent, Confucius decided to leave and joined by a group of his most loyal disciples, he traveled across China's war-torn states in an attempt to persuade other rulers to take on his ideas. On this trip, one thing, he tried to practice his ideas, to try to persuade all the kings to accept his philosophy the way his idea about how to govern a good society. They work together, they travel together, they help each other. They contribute their own ideas into a pool of rich philosophy. This is one of the most famous periods of Confucius's life. During the next 14 years, Confucius traveled back and forth between around eight of the smaller states in China's central plains, spending years in some and just weeks in others. It was a long, arduous journey. Caught in the crossfire of states at war, and without shelter or security, they'd be kidnapped, lose their way, and on many occasions, even come close to death. The challenges they faced forced Confucius to refine and debate his philosophy. And it is during this time that he developed one of his most profound ideas, the concept of the Zhuangzi, the morally noble or superior man. A Zhuangzi normally is translated as um, noble man or gentleman, but a better translation is exemplary person, because whether it's a man or woman, we should all strive to be Zhuangzi according to the Confucian tradition. Somebody who strives to be a Zhuangzi should try to extend the love and care beyond the family, should care about justice and morality, not about their own self-interest, first and foremost. And it's a lifelong struggle, one that never ends. Unlike the rulers of his own age, who ruled by the sword, Confucius believed a true Zhuangzi ruled with virtue, putting his people's well-being alongside his own. 
，始终是一个最根本的问题，就是约束权力的问题。皇帝有权力，所以儒家设计了一整套东西来约束皇帝，也就是后来儒家的政治哲学，爱民，爱所谓的爱民如子。But Confucius also gave the word a radical new meaning. Before him, a Jingzi meant someone of noble blood. After, it meant someone not of noble blood, but of noble character. There's something quite revolutionary in this. He's inviting people to look beyond the trappings of power, to look beyond physical attractiveness, to what we might say is an inner beauty, uh, uh, virtue, ethics, and the like. And so this is, this is one, of the, one of the things I think that he realized during this period of exile. The best examples of Confucius's reinterpretation of the word Zhuangzi are his disciples themselves. Drawn from every section of society, None were of noble birth, yet all had the innate potential to be noble of character. Amongst his disciples, there were all types. Um, his disciple Zi Gong was a merchant. Zi Lu was a warrior type. And two of his favorite disciples, Yan Hui, was from a commoner's background, from a very, very poor family. And Zhong Gong was someone whose provenance was very questionable. I love Confucius' description of Zhong Gong. He said that it's possible for a descendant of a plow cattle, you know, to be born with perfectly formed horns. I think what all this tells us is that Confucius did not measure a person's worth by way of that person's family background. At the time, Confucius was very concerned with training future generations so that they would be good and moral leaders. So this idea, what we can call political meritocracy, that the political system should be designed with the aim of selecting rulers with superior ability and virtue, that's central to the analects of Confucius, and it's, it's very central to the whole Confucian tradition. These ideals didn't just apply to potential rulers. The ideas of Li and Junzi found their origin in the most important unit in Chinese life, the family. <laughs> At Chinese New Year, millions of workers from all over China return home to their families in what is the largest mass migration of humans on the planet. At the heart of this celebration is another of Confucius's most important concepts, what he called xiao, often translated as filial piety. Made from the Chinese character for old above the character for young, Xiao illustrates the respect the young must pay to their elders and ancestors. And over time, Xiao became so important to Confucian thinking, it developed its own manual, the Xiao Jing. The reality of China's economic boom means that many families now live thousands of miles apart, and for many migrant workers, this is the only time in the year they can return home to see their parents. I'm 
很久，我也很好几年没回家了。都在外面，所以我小孩，我老妈身体不好，我小孩一直都在这身边。二十多岁的人的思想全面，他就这个思想好像有点，呃，像小孩子那一种怕孤单，所以给点时间陪他。你比我幸运，我十三年没在家过生日。<笑>你哇，好不容易哦！十三年不容易啊！十三年其实说十三年好漫长的，挺快的对我来说，非常快。我工作正好十三年。嗯，我觉得很煎熬。我就是一年不回家看一次我老爸，我都觉得很煎熬，因为我太想他，因为他也是最想我。In Sima Qian's biography, we are told that Xiao came to Confucius naturally from an early age. Rather than playing with normal toys, Confucius spent his childhood staging elaborate ancestral rites, in particular for his father, who had died when he was just three. And as Confucius grew up, he realized that the values he found in the family exemplified by the love one had for one's parents and grandparents, could be extended outwards for the benefit of the rest of society. These things should come naturally. I mean, it's natural for the young to respect the older person. It's natural in the village that the elderly actually get their share of food first. I think his genius is that he realized that there is a moral grounding to those practices. What was that moral grounding? It has to do with empathy. He thought of empathy as the one thing that distinguished humans from other animals. That if we are born with that sense, that sort of that stirring of empathy, why not expand it? Why not make it work for the family, for the community, for the state? For all Chinese, the heart of the New Year celebrations is the gathering of the family together in the family home. Before the New Year meal can take place, it's customary to honor one's ancestors. For religion in China isn't to a god, it's to one's shared past. In Confucian thought, this is where Chinese religiosity lies, in the family. And it's through rituals like these that one learns to become a Junzi, a moral person. Can
In 484 BC, after 14 long years on the road, Confucius abandoned politics and finally returned home. Unable to find any rulers to take on his ideas, instead, he decided to transfer his attention to the training of a new generation of dreams. By that time, he was already 68. And once he was invited back to come, to come home, then it was said that his gate was just flooded with young men who wanted to learn from him. And what exactly did they want to learn from him? I think it has to do with the art of government, because several of his chief disciples later on actually became very important people in government. Zi Gong, for instance, served as a counselor, and Zi Lu had a high political position, and there was Zhong Gong was a, an administrator. And so maybe these young men felt that Confucius could teach them something about statecraft, about the art of government, and also how to get into government. To train this new generation, Confucius developed a curriculum based on the ancient teachings of the past. At its heart were the six arts, the six skills a Junzi had to master in order to cultivate his character. They included Li, the rites, and Yue, music, both of which brought harmony to society. And Confucius placed these alongside the essential skills of Su, calligraphy, Su, mathematics, Yu, charioteering, and Su, archery. Most importantly, it's during this period that Confucius is said to have compiled and edited the most sacred books of Chinese history, which are now called the Five Classics. So he then went to the point where he wanted to spread his thoughts. How do you do that? It's to collect the ancient literature, put his thoughts into the ancient literature, put his thoughts into the ancient literature. So when he was in his late years, he was mainly in the ancient literature. 呃，整理古代的文献，呃，再一个呢就是教育他的弟子，当然也希望他的弟子能够把他的思想呢传承，还有呢宣传出去。Confucius's Academy is the subject of one of the most well-known paintings in the Traces of the Sage series. It vividly shows the master and his disciples annotating and discussing the ancient literature. You see the people working on the classical text, warm discussion, heated discussion. And here, Confucius himself, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight people sitting around him, the master and disciples, together develop new ideas. The younger generation is entirely involved in the discussion, in the continuity of tradition. This is exactly reflect the idea and how Confucianism developed over history. The five classics were canonized alongside the analects of Confucius during the Han Dynasty over 600 years after his death. Erected by the emperor in the Imperial Academy, these sacred books then became the basis of China's famous imperial examination system, a rigorous set of exams that were designed to root out the most talented candidates for imperial government. The examinations guaranteed candidates had read the classics and had understood 
the teachings of the sages. And if they understood those teachings, it was assumed, they would be trusted advisors to the emperor and trusted officials throughout his realm. Added to over the following centuries with books and commentaries by later disciples, at the Imperial Academy in Beijing, this vast stone library covers 189 stone steles. With their 630,000 characters, taking over four years to carve. I think in all early civilizations, learning about one's many pasts, not a single past, is very important because past history provides precedence about what does work, how you motivate people, what you do in crises, uh, how you resolve dilemmas. All of this is contained within the five classics and the various commentarial traditions. The examinations themselves were famously rigorous. Candidates had to learn hundreds of thousands of passages from the classic texts, with question and answer sessions lasting over three days. Conducted at four different levels, from the lowest level country exams to the final test at the Imperial Academy, the pass rate was only one or two percent. With such power and privilege awaiting the successful few, some candidates even tried every method to succeed. Uh,墨在上面进行书写。比如说我们会把它放在那边的那个像这个考栏里啊,像这个文具,我们会把毛笔的中间弄空,把这些东西搓成一个小卷放在里面,或者说放在这个一言台底下,放在各种各样的夹
hundreds of Han Dynasty tombs have been discovered across China, many dating from around the first century AD, 500 years after Confucius's death. Inside are stunning representations of the Han Dynasty's vision of the world. Heaven above full of birds and beasts. And the human world of Han horses and charioteers below. If the first Empress Qin Dynasty united the country geographically in 221 BC, then it was the following Han Dynasty who united it culturally over the next 400 years of their rule. And so within these tombs, we see the establishment of the cultural heroes that underpinned China's emerging national identity, including the first known portraits of Confucius. The figures on Han Dynasty tombstones were often carved in different tiers, with court officials at the bottom and the gods at the top with each figure's placement relative to the esteem in which they were held. In Sima Qian's biography, we are told that Confucius died a frustrated man, having failed to convince a single ruler to take on his revolutionary ideas. Spread by his disciples after his death, it was only in the Han Dynasty that his ideas emerged to become the dominant philosophy of a now united empire. Over successive centuries, the ideas of Confucius became so important to imperial China that every new prefecture built a temple to him, elevating him almost to the status of a god. The word Shan, which we translate as god or spirit in Chinese, simply means an unseen influence that has an enormous impact. So you can have gods that represent mountains or rain clouds or beings that are actually living or dead that exert an enormous impact on their surroundings. And I think that's the sense in which Confucius is a god. The Kong Miao in Beijing is now the most well-known Confucian temple. Located next door to the Imperial Academy, for the past 10 years, it has been under the care of Kong Zhe, a 76th generation descendant of Confucius himself. Uh,其次呢,我从小就是,我是出生在孔府里面的,从小在曲府的孔庙里跑着玩耍的长大。所以,嗯,这座孔庙对我而言,它的气味让我感到非常的熟悉,很像我家乡的感觉。
It was here where the emperor himself came to conduct sacrifices to Confucius twice a year. This tradition lasted until the fall of the last emperor in 1911. 我们叫三生。在这个地方呢，他要向孔子的身位上香，啊，要把这个酒斟到这个爵里，就是古代的酒杯。同时呢，还要读一些注。这个注呢，就是祭文，上面就写了我们是如何如何敬仰孔子，就
呃，一开始吧，是作为控制后裔，感觉做这个事情呢，呃，也是应该的。但是呢，随着这个呃家谱续修，我们工作呃逐步的深入，我也是感觉到这个使命感和光荣感、自豪感也是越来越强啊啊！我感觉这个应该说是我这一生当中的一个最大一个收获。Often referred to in Chinese as the first family under heaven, the Kong genealogy is now the oldest and longest accredited family tree in history. With its over two million descendants living all over the world, because <laughs> My name is Kaidi Tong. I'm a 77th generation descendant of Confucius. And my name, Kaidi, in fact, is derived from the Confucian Analects. My grandfather named me. He picked my name. And actually, what it means is having princely qualities—the qualities of a prince. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having me、uh, here today to speak to you. My name is James Kong, or in Chinese, Kong Chui Shu. Well, I am the 79th、uh, generation descendant of Confucius, and my grandfather is the head of the family in mainland China and the most direct line in mainland China. Four, three, two. Music lovers everywhere are mourning the loss. Being a Kong also brings its own pressures. For in return for the prestige of their family name, every member is expected to uphold the values of Confucian morality wherever they live. When I was growing up, my mother pounded into our head that you are a member of the Confucius family, you're a descendant of Confucius, so don't misbehave. When you go to school, you have to be better, you have to be stronger, you have to be smarter, and you have to remember that the honor of your family, the Confucian family, and the entire Chinese people rest on your little tiny shoulders. I was five years old at the time. As a 79th generation descendant of Confucius, I have an extra level of responsibility in the way I behave and the example that I give to other people. So I'm every day I work towards this this good behaviour in myself and hope it inspires other people to do the same. Confucianism's emphasis on hierarchy, tradition, and ancient etiquette has made it the focus of numerous attacks from alternative schools of thought, both during his own lifetime and in the many centuries after his death. In the 20th century, imperial traditions were often blamed for China's poverty and lack of development. Given that Confucianism was the mainstream tradition, it became a principal target. And by the late 1960s, Confucius was included in what was called the Four Olds: old culture, old ideology, old customs, and old habits. From Hong Kong, Zhao Fan, ha ha. Ah, he is the one who is the one who is the one who is the one who is the one. 呃，拆下来以后，他们在造反派，让群众宣传，在库门口。At the height of this period, because of Confucius's deep association with China's feudal imperial past, his legacy was dismantled, and nowhere more so than in his hometown of Chufu, where the Sankong, the three Confucian sites, had to be put. Under state protection. Because we are the state workers, because at that time, this 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 this, the 
，只有离这个四四四百，保护文武四百，这这是国家重点文武保护单位，就在后后门口。我们就把这个这个像嗯三楼施工这种，有国家的一级文物，我们就把它呃都埋到地底下了，啊，就把这个遗物和字画都藏到天花板上边。因为是文物是不可再生的，是国家的这个呃宝贝啊。当时这样周总说那样，就是说你你你把它破坏了以后，你你你就不知道这是这是历史上的东西。所以，因为我是接受这样的思想，所以呢，我就这个这个，那个时候，哎，所以，呃，就没参加造反。Over the past 40 years, as China has modernized and its economy thrived, it has embraced its ancient traditions with renewed pride. Nationally. Confucius has become a symbol of the depth and continuity of Chinese civilization. In the media, his teachings are being brought up to date for millions on national television. That 究竟什么是仁爱呢？说起来简单，学生问什么是仁，老师只回答两个字：爱人。And in schools across the land, Confucianism is back at the heart of state curriculum. 那随着这个中国经济的腾飞，哎，我们又开始寻找我们的精神家园的时候，孔子又开始站起来，还要在精神上站起来。那所以说，那一定要把孔子再请出来，哎，甚至要活在我们的心中。小朋友们，我们该起床了，大家早上好。At the Sihai Academy, a Confucian boarding school outside Beijing, children between the ages of three and fourteen follow a curriculum based entirely on traditional Confucian education, with their day starting at 5:30 a.m. This Sihai Kongzi School's teaching is. 沉静谦和，三拜。哎，这个沉呢是做人最重要的品质。这个谦的意思就指的是，哎，就人做人一定要把自己摆在一个很低的位置，才能够融合于众。哎，最后呢，实际上要达到一个和的境界。哎，也就是说，不仅是个人的身与心的和谐，也是人与人之间的关系的和谐。At Sihai, children are schooled not just in the modern curriculum, but also in the Confucian six arts. <laughs> Crucially, they also learn to recite the Confucian classics by heart. From a very early age, this freedom to read Chinese classics is the most important tradition of Chinese education. Yes, as a child, reading the Confucian classics is more important than the memory of the child. Because the child's memory is very good, he does not need to understand. The age of maturity, his understanding is growing gradually, and then he can use it. 有了理解的内容，这就好比说像那个牛去先早上把草吃进去，然后夜里再慢慢的反刍消化，啊，第二天就转化为能量，哎，可以去工作。我想这个可能是中国教育跟西方教育很不同的地方。Is a focus on what many feel is the most important Confucian virtue, what he called Ren, often translated as benevolence or humanity. 好，那下面呢，我们来讲一讲这个字。这个字念什么？仁。我们知道，儒家的教育它是以仁爱为核心的。但是这个仁是什么意思呢？
，想到自己就要想到别人，哎，想到别人一定想到自己。The word "ren" actually means person, but the character that he uses is the character for person and the number two. And so what he is saying is that the way in which we become consummate as human beings is lies in the roles and relationships that locate us within family and community. It should be translated as the very best conduct that one can express, becoming the very best father, becoming the very best grandmother, becoming the very best teacher. The moment Confucius came to develop this idea was once again during his period of exile. Adrift in the warring states with no ruler accepting his ideas, it was in conversations with his disciples that he elaborated the concept of zun, giving it its secondary impulse, the idea of empathy, what he called su. Fuzi, you yan. 而可以终身行之者乎？其孰乎？己所不欲，勿施于人。Well, one of the problems in Western studies is arguably excessive individualism, and what is the authentic self? I look deep in my heart, and once I find the answer there, then I could find the meaning to life. But Confucius says you don't just look deep in your heart. You have to look at the relations with other people. See how, what are the quality of those relations. If they're hierarchical, that's not such a big deal. What matters is that those relations are characterized by compassion and care. If Confucius formulated Zun and Su to counter the individualism of his own age, then, to many, this has clear parallels in the materialism of contemporary society. To this effect, many Chinese companies have now started to integrate Confucian ideas into the modern workplace. One of China's largest petroleum refining factories, Jingbo Petrochemicals in Confucius's home state of Shandong, has made the concept of zhen and xiao an essential part of their management structure. These values, they believe, not only improve the morality of every worker, but also make their business more competitive. With 又为公司创造了更多的财富，那么就是这样，王府是循环的上升，是让企业更好，我们的员工更幸福。呃，我叫马英鹏，在金博石化这上班。呃，在这上班呢，自己的家人，包括父母还有孩子，都能够公司给你照顾的很全面。关于孔子，以前了解的比较少，只是从书本上看到的一些东西。呃，尤其是进大门，我们的孔子万人的雕像，特别的醒目。从来到以后，对孔子的文化了解的比较多一些。This combination of business and virtue, what some scholars have called practical Confucianism, is one example of how it has consistently evolved with the times. And which some now see as giving China its competitive edge. The values of Confucianism can be seen as something that give China an advantage in its dealings with other countries, in its economic development. Confucianism emphasizes cooperation, collaboration, education, discipline, study. All of those things are important. For success in the modern world, it's a remarkable story. Rejected in his own lifetime, Confucius's teachings have come to define the deepest 
and most human aspects of Chinese life. From the chaos of his own times, through China's imperial age, to 21st century China's newfound status as an economic superpower, they have not only persisted, but have found new meaning in every generation. Why? Because at their heart lies a shared set of beliefs and rituals that have lasted the test of time and which find their ultimate meaning in the most important unit of Chinese life, the family. This reverence for the family stands behind one of the most important rituals in Chinese culture, the grave sweeping festival of Qingming where all the Confucian virtues of Li, Xia, and Zun come together. At Qingming, Young and old visit the graves of their parents and ancestors, which, for Confucius's descendants in Chufu, means a trip to the Confucian forest where their family members are buried. Tao 然后太爷爷,爷爷,然后一起唱片与此。At Qingming, the Chinese give offerings and kowtow to their ancestors as a way of repaying them and as a way of renewing their ties with those who brought them into the world. In Chufu, Qingming is also the occasion for the coming together of large numbers of the extended Kong family. This year, on the 2,566th anniversary of his birth. This year, Kung The gathering of the Kong family at Qingming 
culminates in the grave-sweeping festival to their most important ancestor, Confucius. Conducted in the same spot for over 2,000 years, this has become a ritual of national importance. Given the contribution Confucius has made, not just to the Chinese, but to so many across the world. Confucius在他的成长的历史时期呢，他的理想也是能恢复一个礼乐文化的鼎盛时代，用以礼治国，去呃去把社会的公民的这种伦理道德水准以及社会的发展呢，上升到一个鼎盛时代。It's a remarkable legacy, given the circumstances of Confucius's death. In the final chapters of the biography, Sima Qian writes that, age 72, Confucius, despondent over his failure to have changed the world, witnessed the revisit of the Qiling, a portent of his own death. Where once the Qiling had gloriously heralded his birth, this time it was to herald his end. A few days later, visited by his faithful disciple Zugong, he uttered his last words, a quotation from the Confucian classic, The Book of Songs. Tai Shan Huai Hu. 梁柱摧毁, Zhuyu 